welcome everyone that is here in person, a full house. Um, really happy to be here today with you. I'm John Bowers with Silicon Slopes. We're joined today by, you know, an amazing guest, and he happens to be an amazing friend of mine as well, James Thornton of Daz 3D and Taffy. Welcome, James. Good to be here, buddy. Yeah, this is this will be a fun conversation today. Um, we're we're lucky as Utahns um, and and thriving here in this amazing community of Silicon Slopes in Utah, but we're we're really fortunate to have amazing pioneers and leaders like James. Um, he probably doesn't like that I'm saying that and highlighting a bunch, but we'll talk more obviously in depth today and you'll learn a lot about what has made James and the organizations that he's been a part of remarkable and, and successful. Um, I want to thank really quickly um, our sponsors and then also Salsa Queen today for providing some really awesome chips and salsa. If you haven't had a chance to grab some over on the table, they're delicious. Um, so. Let's do this to break the ice a little. How many in the audience own an NFT? Okay, a few. We call that a third, maybe. How many in the audience uh, trade in cryptocurrencies? Okay, close to half. All right, okay. Um, How's your portfolio today, by the way? Pretty rough the last couple of days, right? <laughs> no doubt about that. Um, how many in here um, have a what you think is a solid understanding of Web3 and the Web3 ecosystem? Okay, maybe that's <laughs> we're getting a lot of maybe <laughs> a, maybe one sixth of the audience. Okay, that's fair. Uh, what's interesting about that is even the pioneers and leaders in Web3 would probably tell you, give you, if they're really honest, they'd probably say about the same thing. It's like, well, we know what we know, but the unknown is what keeps pulling us into this. So we'll talk a lot about this today, which will be fun. On the topic of NFTs, James, what was the first NFT you bought and why did you buy it? This will be fun. Yeah, so, um yeah, but more than the NFT itself, I remember the, the first purchase I made, and uh, it was still, like, I'm still thinking in dollars, right? I bought with Ethereum, um, but it was like, you know, 0.03 Ethereum or something. And I'm like, oh, man, it's a couple hundred bucks. I mean, this is really, really steep. And it was a Robotos, um, which now I think probably the floor on those would be something like, you know, 5 e floor meaning the cheapest you can buy. Um, and, and now I do everything in Ethereum. Like, wanna put a hot tub in? Oh, that's one and a half ETH. Um, I've just, like, over the, the last couple of years now, that's just how I think about it. And so it's uh, not, not only because we make them, not only because, you know, that's an important part of our business, but on a personal level, it's, it's just fun. I love art. I love artist creativity, and uh, it's a passion of mine, and so it's, it's fun to be a collector. Amazing. It's a Roboto. A Roboto, yeah. Nice. Um, your, your career has been a remarkable one, and I think a journey that would be share, fun to share some of the personal specifics a little bit with the audience so they know who you are, what you've done. Um, I'm lucky to know that. We won't share all the specifics, obviously. We don't have time today. But uh, where, so education and first job or two, will you walk us through that? Like, how did you get started in your life? Because this is it's really actually pretty cool to think through the evolution. Sure, no, thank you. Um, so I, I attended the University of Utah, um, studied economics Go for Utes. my undergrad. Go Utes. And then I, uh, I went to Notre Dame for my master's. Um, my first job uh, out of undergrad was with IBM, and I hated it. It was awful. Uh, you know, my boss called me Jeff the nine months I was there, or, you know, I just, I felt the corporate suck, right? I mean, it was, it was not fun. And so my second job, I went to work for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and specifically focused on helping uh, women-owned businesses obtain SBA loans. 
and I met a great company, a little custom framing shop on Redwood Road in Salt Lake, uh, helped them attain, uh, you know, get an SBA loan, and then went to work for them. And from there, uh, I'm embarrassed to say for the last 30 years, I've been in the art business. And for the first 12 years, physical art, um, specifically, uh, you know, custom picture framing kind of stuff. And then uh, the last um, several years, the last 20 years or so, um, really working on, on digital stuff. So I, I was the CEO of Cricut um, for uh, about six years. Um, and that, that was all about bringing digital art content to the DIY space. Uh, so that was fun. Um, again, did that for about six years. And then a decade or so ago, I wound up on the board of directors for this company and at the first board meeting became the CEO. So here I am. Amazing. It's a, it's a cool evolution. Um, well, let's, let's talk about right now the evolution of Daz 3D and now Taffy, which is, I think to most people, they would assume it's like just a sister organization. Maybe you can share some details on that, but let's talk about what Daz is, has been, and how it's empowered Taffy, but then a whole bunch of other uh, entities around the world to accomplish, you know, what they want to do with art and and now in the Web3 space in particular. Sure. So so Daz was founded um, a little over 20 years ago by Dan Farr. That might be a name some of you know. He's the the guy behind FanX. Uh, does the the local FanX here, um, and it was a 3D software platform, um, and. Where, where we would provide a software to, you know, there's probably, I don't know, maybe five or six million users of, of the DAS software today, and then would source content from hundreds of the best artists around the world, 3D digital content, and sell that through the marketplace. And that business is a thriving, great business, very profitable, and then a few years ago, we took the concepts from that direct-to-consumer store, that direct-to-consumer marketplace, and formed Taffy, and uh, it was basically taking the same principles from Daz 3D and the direct-to-consumer strategy and bringing it to businesses. So we first formed the Taffy brand around our partnership with Samsung. And so if you have a Samsung phone, um, all of the content around their AR emoji is ours. So we were on about a billion or so devices um, on Samsung devices, and then most recently, that transitioned into a really natural evolution for us in, in moving forward with NFTs. Love it. Um, how did you name Taffy and why? I like, I like this. Yeah, so we're, uh, our officers are in the old sweet candy building uh, in downtown Salt Lake. Um, and so still the largest producer, I think their facility is now out by the airport, but they're still the world's largest producer of saltwater Taffy. Um, and if you know anything about the physics and geometry that goes into making 3D art, you'll, you'd be, I, I think, surprised to know that it's exactly the same kind of physics, the whole Fibonacci spiral. Uh, it's the same physics that goes into making Taffy. So it just seemed natural for us to be in the old Taffy building to, to come up with that name. That's actually my, my business partner and, and colleague, co-founder Matt Wilburn, actually came up with the name. Not surprisingly, he's a pretty bright guy. He is a bright guy. You, both, you, make, you make a good team. One day we'll have Matt in here too to talk. That, but I, I just love that little story. It's a clever and interesting and intelligent way to stay true to your roots and, uh, and, and germane. Um, all right, so you've worked now and promoted artists in the tech space for years. Um, from your days with True, True View, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you were at Cricket, as you've said, and especially Daz. How is Web3, in your mind, good for artists and good for like local communities and a global community? So, and, and this is still some kind of, you know, I, I think you all probably know the difference between Web2 and Web3. Um, you know, Web2 is really World Wide Web, right? It's the emergence of um, social platforms and the way we kind of represent ourselves digitally online. Web3 takes that to a, you know, a different level with um, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and decentralization, which is, which is really cool. 
and what what that whole space, the whole Web3 space is providing for artists is, I, I, I think it's something like people spend, it, it's almost 20 times the amount of time they spend socializing with people in person, they spend 20 times that socializing with people online. And so what Web3 does is it provides artists and consumers the ability to interact uh, online and to create that virtual identity. And I would go so far as to say, as Web3 continues to become more mainstream, uh, your virtual identity is going to mean more than your physical identity because you're interacting with so many different people in so many ways. For an artist, I mean, if you take, you've probably heard of Beeple. Uh, Beeple actually is a, is a Daz Studio customer. Um, he uses our, our software and content. Uh, struggling artist, um, you know, really worked hard to try to make money, you know, doing galleries and shows, got into the space, created um, one of the first uh, major art NFTs and sold it at Christie's for $69 million. Um, and so, you know, for it, it, it just gives artists access to a, an audience and gives them an access to be able to be creative uh, in, in ways that are really tough to do with oil and canvas, as an example. I love that. I, I think that one of the interesting principles you just, the last part of what you said, is for maybe the first time ever, uh, the broad range of artists in the world now have autonomy in certain ways. You know, they still need to use platform and technology because we're all, we can't be entirely autonomous as individuals in every way, we're dependent. But artists now can be appreciated globally at scale, which is phenomenal. Yeah, that, it, that's, that's absolutely right, John. The, the thing um, I think is, is you know, we're, we're talking specifically about art and artists and certainly, Art is, you know, the, the major category right now for NFTs, right? It's that PFP, your profile pick. It's, you know, the bored apes and the mutant apes. Um, they, the, they're the dominant players in the NFT space. But what I think you're going to see over the next few years, it's going to be everything. It's just the way we, we interact. It's the way we protect our identities. It's the way we, you know, attend football games. Um, it, it's going to be such an uh, important, inherent part of, of what we do. And as the technology continues to advance around blockchain and, and NFTs, you're going to see that it's not just an art focus. It's, it's just life. And our kids and their kids are, are just going to know it as you know, we know it today with our smartphones and with you know, how, how technology advanced in Web 2. You have a very unique uh, uh view um, into what's happening. Um, we've had a number of awesome conversations together and sharing philosophies, all kinds of stuff. But w one of the interesting pieces, when we, when, when we talk with leadership in Web3, many say, and the question to you is, why do most refer to the Web3 space as, well, it's still early? Why, why is that being said? And let, let's kind of help coming from you, educate audience and, and, and others being curious and wanting to get in. Maybe they don't want to get in, yeah. but why is it still early? Well, if you, if you take NFTs as a segment of Web3, as just using that as an example, uh, the, the most prolific marketplace where people trade NFTs today is OpenSea. And OpenSea has, they, they claim to have about um, a million users, but it's probably more like a half a million because people have multiple wallets uh, and, and multiple accounts. So you think about that. There's, there's a half a million people on the largest platform. If you include all of the other platforms together, maybe you double that number. So you're talking about a million people that understand, have access, to, and, and play in the NFT space. You start to move into other areas like machine learning and natural voice processing and artificial intelligence, it's, it's even less. Now, some of that's going on around us and in our lives, and we don't know it, and, and, but it's still just the, the amount of con people who are consuming Web3 technology today is just a drop in the bucket. 
that is, I think, the crux of it all, right? When you think of, of the economics of it and the total market, it's nothing. It is less than a drop in the bucket. It's like a grain of sand, right? It's, it's pretty remarkable to think on. Um, and, and yet, it's being talked about widely and distributed widely, uh, and people aren't quite jumping in. Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about that, because um, the integrity of the space, or you know, call it the quotient of trust or whatever, for people to get in, wh what are some of the reasons that that trust dynamic isn't always healthy? Um, and then how would you say to recognize those you can trust or groups you can trust or projects and currencies potentially that you could have a little more confidence in? Yeah, if, if businesses, for example, again, in the NFT space aren't talking about sustainability, they're not serious about the space, right? That's still probably the biggest concern that, that people have would be the environmental impact, uh, you know, from crypto and, and NFTs in the space. And so, but just like any technology, the advancements are coming so fast and furious. I think I, when you and I spoke this morning, John, I talked about the fact that if I was sitting on this stage three weeks ago, how I would talk about NFTs and, and metaverse and Web3 is very different than the way I'm talking about it today. I mean, that's how fast it's moving. And you know, it, there, there's an education piece, an understanding that I think is important. There's the environmental sustainability. And then there's the, you know, the whole point, I think one of the things that makes you know, blockchain and Web3 difficult for people to wrap their heads around you know, the whole concept of blockchain is decentralization, right? It's, it's power to the people, right? Um, when you talk about um, decentralized autonomous organizations or corporations, they're basically companies that are popping up that don't have a leadership. The, the company's governed by a set of rules that are, are written on the ledger and stored on the blockchain. And, and it's, it's, such, it's such a difficult concept um, for people to think, you know, that, that, again, that concept of decentralization, when they go and they see, okay, well, if I want to own a board ape, I think the floor, so the cheapest you can buy a board ape today is about 120 Ethereum, which is about $360,000 or something, $340,000, something like that. That doesn't sound very much like power to the people, right? It doesn't sound like that it, it's acceptable, it's accessible to the masses. And so I think people, companies that are, are wanting to provide leadership in the space, they have to think about that by nature, decentralization has to mean inclusion, it has to mean education, it has to mean accessibility. And, and today we're really at just the, the tip of the spear of all of that. Well said. All right. Because we know each other, I'm going to throw I'm going to throw a right hook at you with a okay. question. Fair, <laughs> okay. Because it's also related to what we just talked about, like trust of in the space and and the ecosystem that's growing. So this hard question, I mean, maybe we can categorize it as that. The right hook. New technologies have been at the heart of what you're building, and and for years, you knew about blockchain in 2017-18. You may have been sitting in the best position, possibly in the world, actually, if we're being really honest. Like I, I know that probably sounds really bold, but legitimately, if you knew all that they had done and what they've been doing, you were sitting in the, maybe the best position, best seat in the world to jump into the space. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you do that? Your, your honest answer, the one you've given me before yeah. as we've talked about this yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so, so you're exactly right. In, in 2018, I spent three months studying blockchain at, at MIT. I was convinced it was the right pivot for our business. It's, it's what we should be doing. And I flat out chickened out um, for all of the reasons that, that we just talked about, right? And that's why, I, I mean, I, I don't know how much you all know about how metaverse is is such um, so web3 the hub here in Salt Lake is in, in surrounding areas is literally considered um, one of the best hubs for web3 on the planet um, and part of that comes from people like Chris Lee from artifact 
um, because he wasn't chicken. <laughs> And because he did make the leap early, early on in the process, I could go into detail while why we were concerned about alienating our existing artist community. I mean, we we source content from the very best digital artists on the planet. Um, most of them still to this day are struggling with making that pivot uh, into the NFT space, as an example. And so, um, yeah, I just I got nervous. I, I thought it was too early. Uh, I made a mistake. It happens to all of us. <laughs> well, you, you guys continue to do amazing things as, as companies and, and your team. Let's talk a little bit about philosophy, building teams, the way you approach running, running your businesses, and, and, and kind of that family you've built. You guys have built a cool family, a very cool culture. What, what are the, for you, what are the most important principles uh, in building a team and running an organization that's healthy? So again, I'm, I'm dating myself, but about 15 years ago, um, Inc. did an article on, on our company, at that time it was Cricket, and recruiting people to small markets, and um, I, I still stick by, they, they ask me that question, like, how do you, how do you build teams? And I think that what, what separates good leaders from great leaders, or first great leaders, make the decisions that other people can't or won't make. And I have some great decision makers that are, are my colleagues and, and corporate family. Um, they're, they're people that aren't afraid to make mistakes. They aren't afraid to fall and pick themselves back up, but they, they make decisions. Um, and the second thing is you just, and I know it sounds cliche, but it's so true. You surround yourself with people that are better than you are, um, that are smarter than you are, and, and you know, don't be afraid of it. Um, I, there, are, there are a number of people at our company today that can do my job better than I can. And I'm convinced of that, and I welcome it, and I'm glad they're, they're on the team, because they push me, they, they make me work harder and work smarter, and I learn. I learn every day from them, so. A true servant leader, as I've watched you and gotten to know you, which is, is admirable. And, it, and that culture um, turns into relationships first, and, and it improves those outcomes. You guys have lived that. By um, the way, John, I think that's particularly important in today's environment. I'm, I'm sure those of you that are responsible for building teams, um, it's tough sledding out there today, finding talent, affordable talent. I mean, you're, you're competing. I, I was just looking at, we're, we're probably, I bet we have 50 or so open recs right now for, for hires. And we're competing against Coinbase, um, who doesn't have an office here, and Crypto.com, who doesn't have an office here, but know that we have talent in that space and in, in this market. And, you know, they're paying Silicon Valley wages or New York wages or whatever because they don't care. And COVID, the, the whole fact that companies are thriving, especially companies like ours, and with, with most of our employees being developers or engineers, they can work remotely. And so it's super competitive. If you're not developing like that cultural interest, that cultural love, and that you know, people want to be there. If it's all about if it's all about the economics, you're going to lose because it's really, really hard today. A amen to that. Um, so, for our audience and others listening, if they if they want to get into the space, one for employment. Let's start there. What would you suggest? And how do existing skills in Web two economy? translate into a Web3 economy? Yeah, so there, there are, are no, I, I mean, I can't think of an area of our business that we're not hiring today. So, um, you know, again, if, if, if you're somebody who, who is, is an HR professional and you wanna make the transition to Web3, one of the things you've gotta figure out is how you recruit and train and retain employees remotely, as an example. Um, you know, marketing, traditional marketing is, is very different um, than, than what people are doing today. So for, as another example, 
you know, people aren't doing traditional marketing in the Web3 space. It's all about building community. So if you're a marketing professional and you want to get into Web3, man, you, you better have a good handle on how to build Twitter and how to build Discord um, because it's, it's all about community. And I think you're going to see that more and more in, in Web3 are these pockets of community and being able to, to develop, you know, those community relations are, are more important than, you know, paid search or other kind of traditional marketing uh, that you'd see in Web2. That, I, I find that both fascinating and also obvious. <laughs> it's kind of that simple obvious that we, we forget about sometimes, but you and I have talked about this before. In a, in a very unique way, we're creating all of these incredible currencies across the world, but more than ever, we're realizing what the real currency is. It's us. It's people. It's our, it's our relationships, right? It's what we believe in, what we get behind, the communities we're a part of, and how we invest in those. And as I've watched uh, you and your team grow, Daz and Taffy, you've focused so much on those relationships. I mean, it'd be, if I were to go work for another company, I would love to come work for Taffy, right? Done. Work for you. Done, John. Um, it, so when it comes to, let, let's, a couple more questions and then let's go to the audience with a few things. Um, I, I'd, I'd love if you can, whatever you're, you're legally able to share, um, share with the audience both today and then listeners of the future, as this will be on Silicon Slopes TV, maybe a sneak preview into some of the projects you guys are working on. Sure. You guys are working with behemoths around the world. Yeah. And so, and maybe talk about a couple of the projects you've already done if, if the audience isn't fully aware. Yeah. Because you guys stay, the amazing thing is, on this point, you, stay, you guys stay quiet. You're, you, you don't get all the credit. You make all of your clients and partners look remarkable. So let's, I know you don't brag, but let's just share some of the facts and people will realize what Taffy and Daz have been behind. And then, Maybe a sneak preview of one? Sure. Cool. Um, so, so what makes our company unique in the space is it, we, we launch our own collections from our creation to writing the smart contracts to the minting, you know, hosting the websites, uh, building our discords, all of that. So like the t-shirt I'm wearing, we did a collection called Non-Fungible People and it's primarily a female-based um, collection, and, but really explored some of the underrepresented, unre underrepresented communities in the space. So for example, there's a, a non-binary, uh, female-identifying part of the collection, there's a Down syndrome part of the collection, um, there's a Muslim part of the collection, and we, we worked with, the, the beauty of our artist community is we have artists all over the world. So if we're designing a hijab, we, we can go to an artist in that part of the world and, and design it. So we do those, those collections and we, we have several of those coming out. We'll be, um, and we'll be a, a launch partner um, with Coinbase for their new NFT collection. And we're doing um, a Qubits kind of, uh, almost a, a Lego kind of Minecraft type collection. Um, we, we have a collection coming out on Crypto.com, which is seven visitors, um, which is kind of an alien, aliens kind of invade the planet kind of, uh, kind of theme. We have another collection which is unique to us as well, where there, there's something in this space called a rug pull, which is basically what people will do is they will get into the space, they'll make millions of dollars, these creators, and then they disappear and they leave the community. And so we're working with one of those rug pulls called Evolved Apes, where the holders, a community has kind of, you know, they've, they've risen up to try to resurrect uh, the, the, you know, the, the project, and we're helping them with that. Um, so all kinds of, of fun stuff. And then the other side of our business is all about the technology. It's all about the utility. So uh, like our friends at Artifact, they did all of the art and all of the design 
we provided the 3D utility that allows you to take your Clone X, as an example, into other platforms like Unity or Unreal so that you can make a game or do an animation. That's our tech that, that does that. Um, you know, we just did the Batman collection with Warner Brothers and, and DC. So you'll, you'll see a lot of, of both of those. We probably have six or seven of our own proprietary collections we'll be launching in the next few months and then multiple you know, brand activations. Um, we're working with the largest cosmetic company in the world to do a makeup drop to our, our, you know, to our own collection, as an example. Uh, we're working with a, an auto manufacturing company that's coming out with a line of electric trucks. Uh, I probably said too much there. Um, but helping, uh, those will all be accompanied by an NFT. Uh, when you buy those new trucks. Um, so just a, a, a wide array that shows off both our, our art capabilities and our technology. I love it. Should we take some questions sure. from the audience? You bet. They might have more intelligent <laughs> questions than I have. Not my. I will. doubt that, but here goes. Um, I'm in the print-on-demand e-commerce space. I'm just curious what opportunities you might see in Web3 for e-commerce, physical products. Yeah, so, so there, there's absolutely, um, a, they call it fidgetal, a fidgetal component where um, you, you, you get both the digital asset or, or digital form of, of whatever you're producing and then it comes with a physical form. Um, for e-com, I, I think just about every e-commerce company, if, it, again, if we're sitting here in a few years, um, all of those businesses are gonna be on the blockchain because I think from a security perspective, um, as an example, uh, it just makes sense. It's the, the right thing for businesses to do. So I think you'll see, you know, and I'm talking about big platforms, you know, there's, there's rumblings among the Amazons of the world, as an example, you know, moving to blockchain and moving to decentralization. Um, so it's, for e-com, it's just a, a natural, Web3 will be a natural extension for e-com businesses, for sure. Hi. Hi. I work in the fashion space, so I'm a fashion designer. And um, my question surrounds fake NFTs and also protections of identity within facial recognition systems and the use of faces without permission. How do you feel about that? And yeah. is there a workaround that's happening to secure people's identities as well as art? That's a, that's a space that is super underdeveloped right now, especially when it comes to likenesses. It's so incredibly hard to police. I mean, one of the things you get with blockchain is you get, and I just mentioned this, like a different level of security, but that also brings a different level of autonomy. And, um, and so you, you get knockoff collections and you get people stealing likenesses. Um, I, who knows? to be honest. O OpenSea has to do something about that. At the end of the day, they have to be the stewards that, that police that. But it, again, it's so early that it's, it's incredibly difficult to control. Um, I, I have a good friend in licensing um, at Disney, as an example. And you know, you've got Mickey all over doing things that they don't want Mickey doing. Um, and they, they can't stop it. Um, it's it's really hard, and that's gonna that's gonna have to be addressed. Um, I'm I'm part of the uh, of a coalition here in Utah that works with legislators to pass laws. Um, so it's everything from government regulation to holding those marketplaces like OpenSea accountable. Uh, but it's it's really hard, and theft is really hard. I mean, it, uh, on on one hand, you're talking about security. We could all share lots of stories of people that have had their crypto wallets hacked. Um, you know, my, my brother lost $100,000 on the Exodus platform two days ago. Um, it's, it's brutal. Um, so you, you'll see technology like Ledger, for example, that, that works on cold storage to protect, um, you know, your assets. But it's, it's, it's a problem for the space right now, for sure. One quick thing I would just say on that, too. Um, do, do your due diligence on, on projects. Don't just trust it, like, and don't rush into the quick buy. You got to get in and buy. 
I mean, really think through things before you just jump in and, and spend your money. So I have a question um, over here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so if you think about Bitcoin's ledger starting in 2009, and here we are with NFTs, and the progression that it's taken, um, you know, cryptocurrency to be more accepted, how long do you think it'll be for NFTs to get to that point? So in other words, do you think it's going to be truncated because now there's more acceptability of the, the Web3 kind of concept and blockchain? Or, or where do you see that progressing or how? Yeah, so, so I, I think there have been recent developments that will accelerate the adoption of, of NFTs. For example, uh, I, again, to, to play in the NFT space, you also have to play in the crypto space, right? You have to have Ethereum or Solano or some other form of crypto. Uh, that's all changed. So, you know, on most of the platforms now, you can pay with fiat. You can pay with a credit card. So giving that kind of accessibility where people don't have to be crypto holders and can still get in, in, into the NFT space ha has been helpful. I, I think, again, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see mainstream things like, you know, your, your ski passes are gonna be NFTs. Um, you know, your movie tickets are gonna be NFTs. And as that happens and people get more and more comfortable, um, you know, it's just natural then that people will decide they, they want to start to collect as well. But, and, and that technology is coming and coming really, really fast right now. On a personal note, you mentioned you were at MIT a few years ago and you chickened out and didn't get into the industry. So two questions. One, what finally pushed you into it? And two is how long was that process to going from not being in it to being in it? Yeah, great, great question. So um, what pushed me is, I'm, I'm going to go back to the HR question that, that John asked. Um, I got some smart people on, on the team, and they pushed me, and they pushed us uh, in, in, into the space. That along with, with partners, again, we, our, our first, when we first started Taffy, it was all about the mobile space. And so we had partnerships with Warner Brothers and Coke and Champion, and a, a really good friend of, of mine at Champion, um, of, our, of, of our company at Champion, where we did some licensing for the Samsung platform, um, pushed us into getting into NFTs. And we literally went from not doing anything in the space to our first launch, which, which was Champion, in about two weeks. Uh, he now works for me, by the way, the, the guy from Champion. So. Um, but it, it was it was good people, smart people pushing us to, to make that move. Um, so I I had a question about how um, with a lot of people that I know and myself included getting into the NFT space, I bought my first one over a year ago, well, almost a year ago. And the gas fees like just blew me away because it, at least in consumerism, not being related to NFTs, it's you just something costs a certain amount. You go, do I want to pay that much for that item? And then you decide that you're going to do it. But then you're like, oh, wait, now I also have to pay, you know, the gas fees are getting out of control to a point where it's almost sometimes more in gas than it is for the actual NFT itself. So how have you been dealing with that? And maybe even how do you think just the community as a whole is going to really want to jump in if sometimes the gas is going to cost more than the NFT? Yeah, so... Uh, again, without getting too technical, uh, you've got blockchain technology like Ethereum, um, and that's where most of uh, is still traded. Most NFTs are traded on on, a, on the Ethereum platform today. Uh, and you're exactly right; the cost can be crazy. I, I think the largest um, dollar-wise, largest NFT drop in history happened this last weekend. The Yuga Labs folks who make Board Ape and Mutant Ape um, sold land. Uh, it was called Other Deed, and uh, to to mint your land, um, I think was somewhere in the range. I'm going to get this wrong for sure, but I, I think about two ETH. Um, so call it four thousand, five thousand dollars. And gas, when it first went up for sale, was about seven thousand um, dollars. And so you know, all, all people could do is just just wait and wait for it to calm down, but then they're worried they're gonna miss out on, on obviously getting the, the, the land. So Ethereum's working on what's called layer, a layer two solution, 
which is um, reducing the, the, the cost of, of gas. And they estimate that that cost will come down about 90% when they, they implement. Uh, the latest date that they said they were gonna have that is June. So we'll, we'll see, but um, there are other kind of layer two solutions, so cheaper for those prices. Um, for, for anybody that doesn't know what gas prices are, basically it's the energy that you consume uh, to, to mint something or um, record something across the blockchain. And um, so with, those, with the emergence of those layer two solutions and something they call lazy minting, which isn't minting until a sale takes place, that kind of thing, um, that hopefully the cost will, well, they, we need them to come down. As far as um, people, you know, because there's always someone who has more money than someone else. Like, there's just always someone else out there. As far as I understand, they can just say, I'm just going to pay, you know, it doesn't matter to them. I'll pay $20,000 in gas as long as that guarantees me that I'm going to get this NFT. And so you always kind of have the sharks or the whales coming in and, and taking all, you know, like, well, they'll pay whatever it costs just to get it. And so is this Ethereum layer two supposed to also solve that? Or if it's the first person to physically send the transaction, regardless of how much they pay, or are people still going to be able to just increase? Because I know you can turn it up and just say, I'll be, I'll be willing to pay more gas to get it to go through right now. So, so that, that'll be in the hands of the individual companies, right? If they allow people to still speed up the gas and, and pay more. Um, but that's the whole point of layer two is standardizing those gas prices, not just making it cheaper, but making it cheaper for everybody, right? Making everybody paying the, the same price. So, and, and the way people structure their collections, they do things like um, allow lists or white lists where you're, you're able to get on the list and as, as long as you make that list, it doesn't matter if, if you know, there's a bunch of whales that are on that list, um, you, you know, you're, you're guaranteed a spot. And so that's, you know, if you're serious about NFTs, you want to avoid the public sales and you want to you wanna work on, on getting part of those white lists and you can do that um, by again, just participating in the community. You join the discords, you join the Twitter, um, and you qualify for those whitelists, then you're guaranteed a spot. Uh, and then you're not competing in the public sale against you know, big spenders. On that note, um, how can they get a hold of your team and if they're interested? Yeah, so um, you're, you're welcome to, uh, to, to email uh, us at info at maketaffy.com. Um, that'll, that'll get you on our, our, our radar or just reach out to me directly and I'll, I'll make sure that resumes get where they need to go. But we are hiring, so please, yeah. if you're interested. Everybody is. <laughs> cool company to work for. Well, let's, let's get a round of applause for James and his generosity with ideas today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, my friend. And, and thanks to our audience and listeners online as well. Um, and stay tuned for uh, coming weeks and other uh, sit-downs with amazing people here. Appreciate you all.